Hey, Jay. I read. So, uh, you, I'll, I'll ask Gary generally, do you have any update on your future with the hockey club or what you would like it to be? Well, I've worked here for seven years, uh, proud member of this organization. Um, this is my third different job title, and uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my time here, and um, I don't have any update on it. Um, Ken and I, uh, you know, we're getting through our player meetings right now, and, and uh, I'm sure we'll sit down uh, early next week and, and um, you know, work through it. Jay, I wonder as, a, as part of your co coaching process at the end of each season, you know, what do you do to evaluate yourself and to look back at how the year went and, and things that went well, lessons you learned? I imagine you got all kinds of notebooks. Mm -hmm. What's your process now? Well, you mentioned one of them right there is that I take detailed notes on uh, every day uh, as you work your way through um, a season. Uh, and I go back and I personally look at um, the things I was thinking at different times um, and looking at the reasons why we made certain decisions, those type of things, how we handled certain situations, how we got through adverse moments, uh, those type of things. Um, I think though what it happens immediately after uh, your season ends is that um, you want to make sure that uh, you're you're wrapping things up with your players um, the right way and in a timely fashion. So um, yesterday, obviously, there were some medicals and a team meeting and whatnot. We got through some meetings with some of our younger players who didn't play in the playoffs. And then over the next couple of days, um, you you meet with players and uh, you ask good questions and most importantly, you listen. How much better a coach do you think you are at the tail end of this playoff than you were, say, before game one of the whole experience started? Um, yeah, I do. I think um, experience is, uh, is really important. Um, you know, I felt ready for this opportunity in February based on my preparation through 17 years uh, in, in professional hockey. Uh, I felt ready heading into the playoffs because uh, I've been part of a lot of playoff games in different different fashions or different job titles, but it wasn't my first time in this league at um, getting ready for a, a playoff series. But I think when you work your way through, uh, you learn different lessons along the way. And um, that first series versus LA, it, it's not like it all went smooth and uh, it was just smooth, smooth sailing. There were adverse times. We learned a lot about each other in that series. Um, I thought our habits held up under pressure. Uh, we worked our way into the second round series versus a heavily f favored Calgary Flames team, the number one team in our division. We were able to dispatch them in, in timely fashion. Um, and learned a lot of lessons about our group uh, during that series and then obviously headed into the third round of the playoffs and it didn't go our way and I think you can um, learn as much uh, um, and maybe even more lessons uh, when you don't achieve what you want um, and that's the process that we're filtering right now. We're learning and processing those lessons. Jay, what's the most important thing you've done here since February 11th? Um, that's a good question. Um, I can tell you what I tried to do. I, I you know, I think it's the, the job of the head coach to define what's most important, um, to provide a sense of true north, and that's, that's what I tried to do. Um, sense of hope at that time when when the team was um, out of the playoff picture. Uh, so try to provide a sense of hope and a spirit of optimism. Jave, you look now, you have the off season. How much of an advantage will it be for you to prepare, you know, rather than come in with 24 hours notice for a team? What's going to be the biggest advantage as a coach for you heading into training camp next year? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to get to that question. 
I want to start out by saying one of the advantages of coming up the way Dave and I did at that time was there w there wasn't um, we got thrown right into the fire <laughs> and you know it was I think it was five games and seven nights seven and nine travel all over uh, the team was out of the playoff picture we were uh, going to play a murderer's row of Tampa Florida and and Carolina on one of the road trips and all that kind of stuff so w what we did at that time we just tried to use our eyes, our instincts. Um, we weren't beholden to any biases on players or anything like that. We just came in and tried to use the benefit of our experience um, in order to make the best decisions possible. Didn't mean we made every right decision, um, but we weren't... Um, caught up in all the the stuff around the team at that time we just tried to to um, push our team forward a little bit each day so that I think even though it wasn't ideal or typical or normal for people in their first opportunity um, I didn't see it as a bad thing at the time I think going back to your initial question um, about the advantage I think the preparations for next season began yesterday and uh, I think, and it goes back to Ryan's question, it starts with a thorough review of what occurred. And it's what occurred during the 2021-22 season. It's about what occurred during the, um, from February 11th till June 7th. Uh, and it's also about what occurred just specifically in the playoffs. And I think when you do your work, you actually go through and you're meticulous in your approach, in your how you review things, I think answers become clear. And when you start to find answers, that informs how you want to proceed going forward. So I think there is advantage to that. Um, the one advantage you might have is lots of head coaches don't necessarily know the young players in the organization. They come to camp, you've got two weeks of training camp, and they got to make a, an impression on you. You look at guys like Broberg and maybe Nima Line and Holloway, etc., Skinner. When you go to camp, every team's got to bring in a few young guys every year. It's a young league. Do you, when you evaluate guys, will it be easier because you don't just have to focus on three preseason games when you're looking at those players and, and even maybe a guy like Ryan McLeod and where you think he can go? Yeah. I think the players you mentioned, and based on my experience in Bakersfield, um, I have shared experience with a lot of the players um, in our organization. So it's not um, it's not about seeing them for three three preseason games and making an immediate judgment uh, based on just only on what you see. You have a shared experience. I think. Um, you know, you, you mentioned Ryan McLeod. Um, one of the things when we first came up, Dave and I, we knew that Ryan McLeod was an elite penalty killer in the American Hockey League. At the time, the penalty kill was taking on a little bit of water from December 1st till February 10th or 11th or whatever it was. Based on our knowledge of what he could do at that level, that informed some of the decisions that we made in terms of his, ele his elevation of penalty kill ice time. Uh, same thing with Kyler Yamamoto in that situation. So that's an example of how your experience with that player allows you to make some informed decisions. Um, for me, with those players, I not only have shared experience with them, but they have shared experience with me. And so they're very clear on what expectations are. They understand that um, I value being tough-minded on standards of performance. Um, and I think they would, could attest that I have a keen understanding of how people operate. And, I, and that's a core tenet of my coaching philosophy. Um, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's a blend of both. Hi, Jay. Um, I hope I paraphrase this correctly or fairly, but you, I know you've said a few times that the difference between being an assistant coach and a head coach is being, in, being a part of the decision and then ultimately making it when you're the head coach. Yeah. How did you feel like your, uh, your decision-making came along as you, you got your feet wet and, and grew in the playoffs here as a head coach? Yeah, I think, um, I think 
for me, um, I tried to follow the same processes that led me to this position. I think um, on February 11th, the team was five or six points out of a playoff spot. I think uh, my mandate was to get this team into the playoffs. Um, we made the playoffs. We won two rounds. We made it into the third round. And along the way from um, February 11th till June 6th or 7th, um, we had to demonstrate an ability, we and me specifically, had to demonstrate an ability to make hard decisions. And uh, I don't profess to say that I made every right decision or our coaching staff made every right decision, but we played hockey in, in the month of June. And uh, I think if um, we would have taken that bargain on February 11th. And so I'm proud of uh, our players. I'm proud of our coaching staff. I'm proud of our organization that we made it to that point. Um, but there's more there. there. In order to get to where we want to get to, um, we have to continue to strive to improve. And as I said to uh, Jason, that process began yesterday. Um, your initial question was about decision making. I think when you demonstrate an ability to make hard decisions, then when you speak of soft values, um, I think people get it. And uh, so, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, there's a part of your, your answer that was going to lead me to my next question, and that's, um, you know, this team has made incremental steps over the last few years, and obviously this one in the playoffs making a, a bigger step. Um, but getting from the conference final and getting swept in the conference final to getting to that, that next step is, is probably an even bigger one. How, what needs to happen for that to, uh, to materialize and, and ultimately win the Stanley Cup here? Well, it goes back to Jason's initial question. I think you got to do your work. Um, I don't think there's any substitute. Hard work works. And now we're in the process of um, really looking at every aspect of our, of our operation. We're happy uh, with how far we got in the 20, uh, uh, 2022 playoffs. When I say happy, I mean... We're pleased that we took a step here, um, but we're not satisfied. Our bellies aren't full. And for us, we're going back to um, examine every aspect of how we do things. And there's no substitute for that. So um, we're pleased with how far we got. But as I said, uh, you know, we're still hungry. Our bellies aren't full. Couple of questions, Jay. One housekeeping: Was there anybody else who was hurt and playing in the playoffs apart from Leon and uh, Darnell? Yeah, there was. There was lots of guys. Who would I'm going to leave that. Jim, uh, Ken, after so Ken will go through all the details of that, so that way you don't have to hear it twice. But there were numerous people um, playing through various types of ailments. Okay, uh, and the question: The lightning rod player on the Edmonton Oilers is Jesse Pugliarvi with the fans and people. What did you think of Jesse's play? He had five goals in the last 62 games. Yeah. What did you think of his play, and, and where, does, where can he go from here? Yeah, I think it's only fair if I comment on his last 38 games or so that I was here for. Uh, or the, and it wasn't his last 38, but it was the 38 that I was here for. Um, I would say, and this is... Uh, on February 11th, one of the first things that I wanted to do with our lineup was distribute um, the center iceman. So we ended up having Connor on one line, Leon on another, Nuge, and Ryan McLeod. So we had four, and we called it at the time, the spine of the team and whatnot. And when we did that, I believe in that first game, Yessie, I put Yessie with Connor and Zach Hyman in that game. And uh, in those games, yes, he, I, I forget the amount of games he hadn't scored a goal in a long time. He scored a goal on the power play against the New York Islanders, an important goal in a 3-1 win for us in the third period. He played against San Jose in a great team win for our team. We won 4 nothing on the road. We went to L.A., won an important game against a division rival in L.A. We came back, we played 
Anaheim at home, and he scored a goal in the second period, and he got hurt. And so he had two goals in four games when the new coach came in. Uh, I think he was starting to build a little bit of personal momentum. And then he, he hurt, he got hurt, and not in an easy injury. It was in a six, seven week injury that affected his, the way he was skating. And uh, it took him a while to get back up and running. When he came back in the lineup, I think we, we put him with, and it was around the trade deadline, we put him with Leon Dreisaitl and, uh, on that line. And it took him a while to get back up to speed. Um, I thought down this, and then towards the end of the regular season, he missed a full week with a non-COVID related il illness. Those things I don't think helped his personal confidence, his personal momentum. Um, but he never lost the belief of his teammates or his coaching staff. I thought he had some good moments, scored a couple big goals for us, one in the LA series, one in the Calgary series. Um, he's a good player for us. He's a good young hockey player. So do you see him then as perhaps scratching the surface? I know they had a player in Colorado named Nikushkin who did nothing in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they, he, Dallas gave up on him and Colorado played. So yeah, are we? I thought Nikushkin was very good in the series against Are them. we to say then that there's still something there with Jesse where he's going to be an offensive player and not just a player who provides energy. Well, I think if you looked at his point totals on this season, he set a career high, not in goals, but in point totals. He's a young hockey player. Um, you know, I think for him, he is not dissimilar th than Ryan McLeod, Evan Bouchard, Stuart Skinner, um, some of our young guys, Dylan Holloway, some of our young players, that's where the growth on this team is going to come from. Uh, and they got some really good experience during our playoff run to aid that growth. Um, but we have a, a strong belief in the next wave of young players coming through our organization, and Jesse's one of them. Uh, I would ask you, uh, we, uh, in the understanding that Stuart Skinner is now waiver eligible, um, you know, probably coming up here next year. In your estimation, is he ready to be a 25 to 30 game backup in the National Hockey League? Um, I think that goes back to Jason's original question again, because when you have some shared experiences, and I, I was the coach in Bakersfield when um, Stuart first came into professional hockey, and uh, you know, his first year in professional hockey, he was up and down between the American League and the East Coast League. In the end, he played three games in a second round playoff series that year. Uh, I felt good about him. The next year, he, he took on the lion's share of games and had his ups and downs, went back down to the East Coast League again. His third year, he backstopped our group to the division championship. He played a hockey game on May 31st of 2021 in T-Mobile Arena to help the Bakersfield Condors win something in their last game. This year, I think he got more NHL experience. I think his last NHL game he got a shutout in. That would have been that San Jose game, uh, my second game as head coach up here. I have strong belief in Stewart's ability. Uh, I've seen him grow. Uh, with his on-ice skill set. I've seen him grow as a person. Um, you know, I, I feel good about Stuart Skinner and his potential as a really good NHL goaltender. Jay, can I just ask you... Um, if Are you, you referencing your original question? No, no, it's good, but I like that. It's nice. I love it. Um, <laughs> If you look at a lot of the public available analytics, it'll suggest that Pugliari's a pretty sound defensive player. Yep. Um, when you look at guys, you look at Pugliari, do you see him as somebody that can kill penalties in the future? And how, you know, if, if guys never got to do it, it's hard to just throw him in, right? So seasons four. What would you need to see for a guy like that to maybe be used on your penalty kill? Well, potentially. So um, I think it's important to be open-minded. And I think the time for experimentation is in training camp, is in um, preseason, is early in the season. So if 
your question about is, is about penalty kill ice time. When, when um, Dave and I came up, as I said, I referenced going back to the December the 1st, the penalty kill was taking on water. I think it was in the 60s, something along those lines during that time frame. And we slowly chipped away. And one of the ways we did that was to, to go to what we knew as coaches. And eventually the penalty kill became a source of strength for our team. Uh, I think that is a potential area for increased ice time. I also think it's important that players in your lineup find a way in order to garner more ice time, you got to play on one of the special teams. So it is a potential. Um, now there's two parts to that equation. It's nice to have a plan, but then you got to use the real in real time information that players give you and judge if the plan's working or not. So you got to be light on your feet uh, in terms of reacting to what you're seeing as well. Jay, different sport, but in football, good coaches add to the playbook as the season goes on. You came up halfway through the year, and in the playoffs, injuries play a factor in terms of practice and yeah. maybe what you can do and how you can adjust. So on that note, theoretically, let's all assume you know, you're going to be back here. How beneficial will be that increased practice time, especially in the start of the season, so that you can, you know, down the road, maybe change some things out, not have to necessarily solely rely on video to make adjustments towards the series? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a very good question, too, because if I look at uh, one of the challenges that we faced as a team from February 11th on was, our, was uh, the schedule and lack of practice time uh, to be able to implement some things you might want to implement. And that's why, you know, I would walk in here and you guys would roll your eyes when I would say, oh, we're concentrating on one thing or the lead domino and this is what we're doing and this is what... It's because uh, it's hard in that situation to give, give the buckshot theory of this, 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 and this. And you have to be very focused and specific in what you want to do achieve understanding the schedule, understanding a lack of practice time. I think training camps are where you begin to lay a foundation. Um, it's where you're able to make um, system adjustments. Um, it's where uh, you're able to um, set yourselves up to compete because you're able to compete with each other in training camp so that you can compete for each other as the season goes on. I'd be curious to your take on being a first time NHL coach uh, in this country, in this market, um, <clears throat> playoff environment, heaping, helping of everything, uh, and just to take on what it was like dealing with the media like this for the first time. It, well, a lot different than it was in Bakersfield, California. <laughs> I can tell you that it was, uh, in, and that's not disparaging to the great people down in Bakersfield, but it was typically one newspaper reporter and maybe a TV camera. While, um, but for me, um, I looked at my daily um, opportunity to be with you, good folks, as an ability for the coaching staff and me specifically to communicate directly to our fan base. I think we have the best fans in the National Hockey League, the most passionate fans, the most knowledgeable fans. So um, I think it is unique. It's unique to a Canadian market. It's a unique to a great city like Edmonton. It made me better. It made me um, really think about the message that I wanted to get across to our great fans. Um, it's part of the job and uh, part that I accept. And um, I think, you know, this is, it was a different year for the city. It was a different year for, with all the COVID stuff. It, it, was, it was a different year for our, our team with a great start and then a tough middle, a coaching change, and then the great run that we went on at the end. I think what's most important is that our fans stood by the team. Our team had the goal of making this city proud. And uh, in the end, we held together through stormy seas. And um, we know there's more to give, but um, we're proud of our effort this year. 
Jay, I'm just curious uh, what your evaluation is of your blue line as a whole, and do you believe the personnel that you have currently is good enough to win a Stanley Cup? Well, I'm, I'm um, proud of our effort, um, not only on the blue line, but in net and up front. Um, you don't make it to the third round of the playoffs with a lot, uh, without a lot of really good efforts. Um, I think we saw growth. Um, I think we saw improvement. I think um, in order for us to get to where we want to get to, and this goes back to a question that Speck asked the other day about uh, defending. I think defending is a, it's a team thing. It's not just on our, our decor. I think we can, uh, there's areas that we can get better in and, and improve. But if you're asking me about the men who dressed on our blue line, I'm proud of their effort. And, um, you know, uh, we're not where we got to without them. Do you expect Philip Broberg to be a full-time NHL defenseman next year? I know it's a long ways off, but yeah. your assessment. Yeah. Um, I'm very excited about Philip Broberg as uh, a long-time Edmonton Oiler. I think he's going to be a heck of a hockey player. Uh, I think he has a very high ceiling. I got to see him in a different way in the American League. Uh, and I got to see him in some stints up in the National Hockey League. When you look at Philip Broberg, he's someone who, you go back to even before his draft year, he's just kept playing hockey and playing hockey and playing hockey and playing hockey with very little break in between because of all the national program uh, things and the drafts and all that kind of stuff. I think it's a big summer for Philip Broberg. I think he has the potential to be a really good player in the National Hockey League for a long time. Um, what he does with his summer and what he does with his training camp is up to him. Um, so I'd be remiss to commit to anything um, in June here, but I'm, a, I'm excited about Philip Rover. He's a heck of a person and a heck of a player. Thanks, guys. Good summer to everybody, okay? Yeah.